everybody. Um, my name is uh, Jack Greinenberg, and I'm from the Netherlands. So that's a surprise, I think. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be here. It's the first time I joined this uh, ARC meeting and uh, event, and I think it's, uh, it's really great. I'm really impressed about the level of uh, the topics and you know, the, the, the speakers, so I hope I can keep up with that. Um, just a little bit about myself. I, uh, I'm in the coding and uh, marking business already for 27 years. So I started very young. Um, started as a technician, seven years in the field, and now leading the um, global service teams uh, for Mark and Mimash. So what I would like to uh, cover with you um, during the presentation is a little introduction about uh, the company the challenges we faced when deploying the service, uh, field service automation, the achievements, because you know the Dutch are very pragmatic, see, okay, what is the result, basically, what did we achieve, uh, the how, key success factors, lessons learned, and then a little bit about how I see uh, the future of um, um, Mark and Image services uh, moving forward. So Mark and Image is a, is a Dover company. Um, so we are um, a $1 billion company with around 3,000 uh, employees worldwide. We develop, we manufacture, we distribute, and we sell and service our equipment. And the equipment is marking and coding equipment. That's to say, we, uh, we, uh, we um, install, we make machines that do coding on, for instance, you know, on the bottom of your beer can, there's a code. If you buy a milk uh, pack, there, you, you check the... the the expiry date, all this kind of, you know, uh, kind of coding we do. Barcodes, QR codes, and we do that with different type of technologies. The laser, uh, the CIJs, et cetera, et cetera. So we are there from the beginning till the end. Sometimes we, um, we face applications for more than 30 uh, printings, more than 30 codings per second, basically. You know, so <clears throat> our equipment is really, you know, not expensive compared to all the equipment that our customers have. It's like 10,000 to 30,000, but it's very critical. You can imagine if the coding stops, there is no product going out. Forget about it, you know. So more and more, the, the, the coding is starting to become important, and you, you see the different scandals we had also in Europe or in China with the baby powder and those kind of things. The customers will have to trace back totally where uh, the, uh, the problems came from. So this is something that, you know, uh, that we master from the beginning to the end. So, uh, Mark and Mimash is covering 100 countries worldwide, 30 uh, um, direct operations, and then the rest is with, um, with partners. We have around more than 50,000 uh, customers, more than 200,000 machines installed, um, and um, we service our machines with around 850 field technicians. So, if you, you do the maths, 850 field technicians, 3,000 employees, yes, we have a very large, relatively large, pool of resources for maintenance and repairs. Why? As I told you before, it's very critical in the process of machines. I'm not very happy with that because, you know, uh, that means that we have, we have a, a, a system that is not very efficient. But now with the IoT and so on, it makes me very excited to say, okay, well, now we can be much better in terms of delivering quality to our customers. But when I saw the first day here with all the cybersecurity, I got a little bit, you know, depressed again. But okay, so uh, it, it will come. So our technicians are typically doing the pre-sales, the installation, training, the help desk planning, preventive maintenance. So it's a little bit more than you said, Ralph. We do the whole scope of, of things that we have to do to support our sales and to support our customers at the end. Our business model is 40% of the revenue is printer sales and 60% is um, consumables, spares, and services. Okay, good. When it comes to our challenge, our challenge is very simple. I mean, if you look at this iceberg, we have to improve customer experience. This is the only driver for services. What is the customer experience when we provide them service? So for that, we have to do the right things, basically. And you know, it's not so very difficult because what, what, what is important for our customers? When they need us, we have to be available. When we deliver service, it has to be of the highest quality. And then, at the end, we have to make sure that we give 
the customers the right advice how they can run their equipment in a safer way, in a more reliable way, and a more cost-efficient way. So it's, it's not really rocket science, but that is always the, you know, the, the challenge that we have uh, and that we, that we impose also to our organization and say, okay, well, I don't care what you do, I don't care about the statistics, but at the end, what is the customer experience about our services? Obviously, there is a lot of things that we need to do behind that to basically say, okay, well, if we master these kind of KPIs, we are quite sure that the customers are satisfied. But, of course, there has to be always the loop that you have to be sure that it is the case. So it's the typical things, like the response time, the time to solve, first time fix, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to do these kind of things for the lowest cost in order to get the highest value for our customers, obviously. So far, so good? So then, you know, what is our challenge? You know, services has always been seen as a necessary evil. We sell our machines, and then the technicians will install it, and if there is an issue, okay, we, they fix it, etc., etc. But if you really want to say, okay, well, I want to add value to our customers, then you have to start managing your service as a profit center. Because only when you, add, when you sell or you deliver value-added services, there is a chance that the customers will value your service and will pay for it. Otherwise, forget about it. So that was our challenge. Three years ago, we started to manage our service as a profit center. 100 countries. It's like a Babylonian, I don't know if it's the right word in, in, in English, but, you know, everybody, all our organizations sell the same machines, same kind of customers, Unilevers, the Procter & Gamble's, etc., the Nestle's, but they always say, well, Jack, in Italy, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's different, you know. That, it's not like in Germany or in, in India. No, 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 it's totally different. No, forget about it. We cannot do it. So this is, this is what, what we said, okay, whatever we, we do, we have to make sure that we start from a standardization. We have to start from a standard. So what is the standard? So driven by the tools that we have today on the market, we say, okay, well, let's fix the standard first and then make the gap analysis with the different organizations. Some organizations are mature, some are not, et cetera, et cetera. So here comes you know, the, the, whole, the whole story about you know, setting the base and setting the standards. But you have to understand that we have different kinds of cultures, different kinds of market expectations, and they are not to be ignored, I would say. I mean, if I go to, um, to India or you know, to, to Thailand, if I go to a hotel, then there are 10 people wanting to take my luggage and bring it to my room, basically. But I have a lorry, and there are wheels on the... <laughs> I can do it myself, you know? I'm almost embarrassed to, 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 to hand them over. But in Holland, if I would say, okay, can you bring me my, you know, my suitcase? And they will look at it and say, yeah, but you have wheels, you can do it yourself, you know? So it's very different, and we cannot ignore, ignore it. It's, it's, it's really the case, so we really have to look at that. So market expectation is very different. In China, they don't want to pay for service. Why? Because I buy your product. So, you, so why should I pay for service? But we see that there is an emerging, you know, between the countries that at some stage the business model will, you know, will come together and say, okay, well, yeah, service has to be paid for, consumables have to be paid for, machines have to be paid for. I mean, it's no, no other way. So we have different technologies. Tools and processes were different. I mean, we have... Uh, Attrition in different countries, so that is more than in the mature countries. So there are a lot of things that we had to, to deal with. Now, we started with the implementation uh, of the field service automation as um, the, you know, the, how you call it, the, the main tool to adapt our processes on to a certain extent. Well, let's just say we do not want to, met, to make too many uh, customization of the tool, so we adapted some of the processes towards the tool. Now, just to, 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 to let you to give a glance of what uh, the achievements were, if you look at the last three years, we increased our margin with, uh, of services with 6%. That's quite a lot. It's six times more than it was in the business case, basically. Well, they didn't want to believe me, but, you know, it was very hard to convince. But, okay, we made it. The other part, the 60%, is a different story because, you know, Next to the, um, the efficiency gains, I wanted to have also a, a tool that could help me with generating 
new revenue streams. As I said before, I, I, my technicians are obliged to say, okay, we fixed the issue, but then um, they have to advise the customer how to run the machines better. So that could be with training, that could be with you know, uh, PMCs, that could be with, uh, with, with using, start using our spares again and consumables. Uh, and, and it's not a selling job. It's their job, basically. They have to uh, advise them how to run better. But the point is that, you know, I needed to have a tool that could easily capture this kind of, you know, uh, uh, cross-selling or, you know, this, this request from a customer that the back office then afterwards could deal with that. So we had this functionality in the system that we, uh, that we bought and um, it appeared that we had 60% more won and closed opportunities uh, in the first year, which, which is nine times more than we, uh, than we calculated. In terms of absolute value, it's like millions, basically. I mean, it's, you know, it's, and it's, 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 it's there. So what I wanted to say is that, okay, this is for me a very great, uh, clear proof that, you know, um, customer experience gone up. Why? Because, you know, otherwise <laughs> they would not buy anything from, from our services, basically. That's, that's very clear. And the machines run better. Okay, so <clears throat> through the field service automation, very much in a nutshell, on the left side, um, uh, the, the field service uh, efficiency, because they can, the technicians can check the history of the equipment, manage the, 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 the stock better, uh, improve the invoicing, you know, from you know, the more than two weeks to less than one day, uh, electronic signature, all, basically all the things that you, know, expect, that you expect from a field service automation tool, basically. On the, ref, on the right side, we see that the additional revenue streams uh, were also supported by the tool, uh, as I said before, with the lead generation, uh, but also to establish the link with the account manager to, to have a much better and, and direct communication with our sales to say, okay, uh, what's going on at the install base? Or the, or the sales say, okay, listen, I'm, I'm busy with a customer to change the machine. So the interaction is, is, is much better and, and in real time. Also, what is very important, bullet point three, is that um, we got a system to incentivize the technicians on the one and closed opportunities. You know, we sometimes forget that, you know. So the guys are always in the field and give advice, but we never are able to incentivize them in some shape or form. I'm always, I was a strong believer that technicians don't need to have a reward like the sales because they do that from their you know, DNA. I still believe that, but in a way, it helps, let us say. <laughs> Then reduction of revenue leaks and the installed base intelligence is a very big improvement as well because we know much better if there is a change of the installed base, if there is a new product to be printed or, you know, or the speed is changed, that we know that and that, uh, that it's in real time in the system. A little bit about the journey of the field service automation. We started with SAP back in 2006 and 2007, so we had only the back office there. Uh, the CS module, etc. I mean, people that work with SAP, you, you know that this is uh, it's good, but okay, it's not very flexible. Um, in 2008, we developed uh, a tool to, to equip the technician to close the service orders, but it was only online and not offline. And then in 2012, we uh, started with Motorola to have a real um, uh, mobile device for a technician. It was not the state of the art, so we did not decide to roll it out further. Um, we did a planning tool, we changed the planning tool, and then, you know, in 2015 we said, okay, we have to do something drastically different and we have to start, you know, uh, finding a, a, a good solution um, for our technicians uh, worldwide. So then in 2016 we defi decided to, um, to work with core systems on this, uh, on this journey, and in 2017 we rolled out the system in the world in the 30 countries in the direct operations, and there is one country left, which is India, and as we speak, uh, we're deploying it now. What are the key success factors? I think one of the key success factors is that we had done a, a six-month pilot to prove the business case here. And it was very hard to convince the, our board of directors to say, okay, well, you know, uh, I can gain 10 minutes time from the technician on site, or 5%, less, you know, repeat visits, et cetera, et cetera, because at the end they say, okay, Jack, but what does that mean? Hmm? Can you do two visits instead of one visit? Can you do three visits? I mean, uh, can we reduce our, you know, workforce with 20%? What does it mean? 
And that's not so very easy to explain. So what I decided to say, okay, well, let's go in the other way. I said, okay, well, we can generate more revenue. Ah, suddenly, okay, interesting, Jack. Okay, so how do you want to do that? So, okay, we built a business case on, you know, advising customers, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, yeah, good, prove it. So we did a pilot in America. We equipped 30 guys with the tool and 30 without. And in six, six months, we saw that 60% more won and closed opportunities with the guys that had the tool. Why did we do America? Because the Americans are very good in cross-selling, upselling, and so on. So they, they didn't, we did not have to teach them uh, on, on, the, on the process, basically. They knew how to do that. So that was a good, uh, you know, uh, so the, 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 the pilot uh, was a good thing to, um, to do at the end, so we could uh, convince the board of directors for, for this tool. Then the change management is really, really, really important. I cannot stress too much on this. This is, this is the, the, I mean, without a decent change management, your whole implementation will, will really fail. So the user acceptance is really important to have the user acceptance. Standardized processes, you have to train on the, on the process skills, um, align the rewarding system, and at the end, team up with your partner, basically, because you can have so many things, you know, uh, agreed upon, but down the journey, there's always things that you have to adjust and, and then you have to trust each other uh, to make sure that at the end, we, we deliver a system that is really, you know, satisfactory to the users that we have. So change management, very important. So lessons learned. What are the lessons learned for, for, for us? Requirement specifications. I thought we were quite good in that already, but still, you know, you're never good enough. You, you have to really write it down what you really want because you know in communication things are lost in translation etc so this is a really lesson learned that even if you think you're good make sure that you really write it down the integration into sub created a big delay for us it's uh, i mean the tool is there already but if you want to integrate it in your you know uh, your uh, invoicing system your stock management system etc etc it's not a it's not an easy thing it, it still it was quite smooth but it's not it, it causes some delay as well and then, you know, the, our ICT policy was very harsh. Our Dover ICT policy was, I think, uh, the most harsh uh, that core systems at that time, you know, um, uh, experienced. Uh, but, you know, then again, when I hear cybersecurity, I think it was, they were <laughs> it was good. So they are very harsh, but okay, it gave us some delays, okay? And then change management, as I said before, do not cut corners. We knew that in ASPAC, we had the biggest gap. The biggest gap, because you know, I mean, what you said, Ralph, you know, in, in the first, you know, uh, they go on, the customer calls, they go on site, do a di diagnosis, they go back, bring the parts, they go back. Uh, it's, we had the biggest gap there. So what we said is that we do a very decent change management there. And at the end, the smooth, uh, we had the smoothest imp implementation in ASPAC and the worst in EMEA in Europe. Europe, there are senior managers, senior organizations said, okay, well, they are, these are okay. I don't have to spend too much time on that. And they struggle the most. So that's a really lesson learned for me, you know, not to get, take things for, for granted. Good. Last slide, just a little bit on the, um, on, on the future service delivery model for, for, uh, for Market Mimage. I come back with the customer experience and to do the right things. The three things, be available, deliver quality, and give advice. Um, we will shift from reactive to proactive. Uh, sorry, from reactive, proactive to predictive, obviously. I mean, you know, even if the, if, if the customers do not want us to be connected to their machines, I still want to have the possibility that the customers can give us better information about what is going wrong. So therefore, we, uh, in our organization, I, spend, uh, I give one of my guys to a core team in the research and development to make sure that we have the right censoring uh, in the machines to have uh, the right, you know, um, serviceability for our future machines. So whatever the case, if it is still, you know, with, uh, with, 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 not with a direct connection, but if the customers can self-help themselves, you know, by, by understanding exactly what is going on and what is broken, then it, this is for me already a very big benefit. I also want to uh, make sure that I double the flexible workforce. Because I do believe that tomorrow's machines will be able to better say 
what is going wrong with our machines. Today, it's not so very uh, clear. So we send a technician, and many times it's the best technician that we have because we don't know what's going on. So we send our best technician, and it will be solved. But tomorrow, I will have to be able to say exactly what is going wrong, exactly what we have to change, and then I don't have to send my best, most expensive technician. I can send a partner with the right tools and, and you know, with, with augmented reality, for instance. So this is what I want to do, basically. So I want to double my flexible workforce for, for to be more available. Because today, biggest struggle, and perhaps there are more companies in the, in, the, in the room here, the biggest trouble for me is always the response time on site. You know, we can do many, many good things, but the response time on site is always a struggle. Then, deliver the quality, standard work, activity-based planning. Okay, as we said before, big data, augmented reality, all kind of things that we need to uh, embrace in order to, um, uh, to be uh, better of service for our customers. And then at the end, I, I know that our business model will change, and I want to anticipate on that. Basically, you know, uptime is always uh, an issue, of course, for our customers in a production environment. But asset management is something that we can do for them, basically. I mean, if we are, you know, connected uh, to, to, to their machines, they don't care about their $10,000 machines. But they also know that it's critical. So then the question is, okay, you can do it yourself, or we do it for you. So I want to be ready to be able to ask, the, the, to propose the question to the customer. Coding serialization, original equipment availability, traceability. Now, well, this is really, you know, very much linked to the, uh, to the coding and marketing industry as we are in, uh, because traceability is key, basically, for our customers. But these are the, the type of, you know, um, um, uh, services that we're going to offer in the future. It's not so much more the traditional services, but the more the consultative services that we're going to offer. Well, at the end, I'm targeting to have 25% cost, uh, cost reduction uh, in servicing uh, our machines. So that will flow back, obviously, to our customers, and a 2,000% more, uh, sorry, 200% more availability of our technicians uh, when, we, when our customers need to reach us. So that's about uh, it for me. Um, so I hope it makes sense. So um, thank you for your attention. And I hand it over to the next speaker.